But I think what, once somebody becomes unstable, the priority is getting re-regulated. But the problem is, is the pro, you know, the priority in the withdrawal community, oftentimes the messaging is the priority is taper and get off the med, taper and get off the med, which often leads to even more dysregulation. I held for three years, much against my will. I mean, I want people to hear loud and clear, I am not pro-medicine, I am, and I hate that I have to take the medicine that I do, but I have to function, I have no other choice. I would rather take the medicine I'm taking and function than taper more quickly and get sick again. I, I don't wanna ever go back to those places again where I felt the way I did. Can somebody heal when they're on meds? Not, not sure. But can somebody be stable on meds? Definitely. Can somebody be regulated on meds? Definitely. Can somebody be functional on meds? Definitely. Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring. It's my pleasure to welcome back Chris Page. Um, Chris is probably one of the best benzodiazepine coaches uh, out there today. He's got expert knowledge on akathisia, um, and 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 yeah, really, by me and many others considered, you know, one of the most helpful people in this space. Uh, Chris gives um, Chris. I, sorry, I get a lot of questions about like, can I heal where I'm when I'm on medications, mm -hmm. and that's what Chris is here to talk to us about today. He's still on medications, um, and um, it's just a very common question. So, Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you and. I'm going to ask you that question. Can people heal when they're still on medications? Well, first off, again, thank you so much for having me back. It's always such a pleasure. And, you know, I'm just so thrilled to have an opportunity to talk about something that honestly is, I think, one of the most personal and important things we can talk about um, for people that are going through psychiatric drug withdrawal issues. Um, I think that I would like to show that I'm kind of the model for a subset of people that are going through this. Um, first off, let me explain just real quick why I'm in this conundrum. Um, Cause I want everybody to hear loud and clear that if I could stop the medicine tomorrow without incident, I would have eight years ago or nine years ago. Um, when I went to the benzodiazepine detox and they took me off a milligram and a quarter of clonopin in five days, they so dysregulated me um, that when they gave me the support drugs of Seroquel and Remeron, medicines I hate ingesting every day, but I have to, um, to survive. Um, they kind of created a house of cards in my nervous system, meaning that by taking the clonopin away so quickly and dysregulating me so dramatically and then giving me these other two meds that were at least giving me a little bit of sleep a couple hours a night, um, they put me in a position where I had to take the medicine to continue the, you know, to have the level of stabilization or at that point, intense destabilization that I had. Because I think this is kind of um, one of the core questions in the withdrawal community is or the conundrums in the withdrawal community, which is if we believe inherently that these drugs are neurotoxic, which for a lot of people they are, and I wanna get better and I'm taking these medicines, how do I heal when I'm taking something that I consider to be poison? I think that's a very important question. And it's something, unfortunately, I think the withdrawal community as a whole doesn't handle in a nuanced way. And this is a very nuanced topic. Um, you know, I think I, you know, I would say that we get stuck in a place where we think, I think, we think that there's only two choices. Either I'm completely dysregulated and doomed and injured and messed up, or I'm completely healed. There's no, it, it's like there's two polar opposites. It's either I'm completely healed or I'm completely dysregulated. And I would argue that there's a lot of room in between for a lot of functionality, a lot of recovery, a lot of healing, a lot of, I mean, I think that's another thing we have to look at is the words we're choosing. Um, I think healing is a loaded, a loaded, you know, uh, term to me. Um, you know, I think I've referenced in other interviews, um, I'm 57 years old. I tore my ACL in my 20s. And even with surgery, it was never the same again. 
Does that mean then that my life has been altered in a way that is unlivable or unsurvivable? No, it's a minor irritation that I can't continue my failed basketball career. But outside of that, it's not really much limitation in my life. And I think it's similar with people that are injured, which is, I think the single most important thing, at least from my perspective, is not healing. The single most important thing that everybody that's on medicine, I would argue, should have as their first short-term goal is stability and regulation, is getting our nervous systems re-regulated again, stabilized again. The symptoms we're having when we're in withdrawal are a clear sign that we are dysregulated, a clear sign that we are already out of balance. And when you, the withdrawal community convinces people that the only way you will heal is to get fully off the medicine and you are dysregulated and getting sicker as you taper, you're really stuck in an impossible situation. And I think that's when I've also seen a lot of terms get thrown around that I think are honestly overused, that I think a lot of people get, you know, they'll have cut drugs, they'll have you know substituted on and off drugs, they will have taken multiple drugs over the course, because I think you've probably seen this, the majority of people that end up in psychiatric drug withdrawal are polydrugged. They're not just on one drug, you know? And I think what happens is, is when we get polydrugged, or even if we've been on one drug, but maybe on and off of it and things like that, is that every time we make a change, we're dysregulating ourselves. We're creating minor injuries. We're creating minor um, stability problems. And then all of a sudden, those stability problems add up and create a catastrophic cascade that then tips over and causes the person to become extremely dysregulated, extremely symptomatic. And I think then the, the dilemma is that the withdrawal community has a tendency to tell people it's the drug you're taking that's the problem. That you're kindled or your intolerance withdrawal or all these different terms, which are relevant terms, but I think are grossly overused sometimes. I think the majority problem for 90% of the people in withdrawal is not the current drug they're taking. It's all the changes that led up to where they are today. And that's why, you know, from my, both my personal and professional experience of going through this for nine and a half years now, is that stability is the most important thing. If, if I, when I, you know, after I got out of the detox and they put me on the other meds, if I had only been focused on tapering, which I did for a short period of time and it made me uh, 10 times sicker and I was already extremely sick, is it just puts people in even more awful suffering situations. And from my nine and a half years of experience and my own personal experience, I think when people are dysregulated, generally the best strategy is to hold the medicine is to not do anything, to let the nervous system figure it out. But again, when people are terrified that they're taking something that's making them sicker, that becomes a antithetical kind of strategy. It, it feels to them like they're just poisoning themselves even worse, and then it scares them. And then I see people taper even more quickly, which that's, then gets them into that position again of being even more dysregulated. And I think that, you know, so for me, if somebody's dysregulated, which there's no other reason for people to reach out to you or me unless they are, because if people are regulated and tapering, they have no need for any coaching or any supportive services generally because they're getting through it. But I think once somebody becomes unstable or dysregulated again, the priority is getting re-regulated. But the problem is, is the pro, you know, the priority in the withdrawal community oftentimes, the messaging is the priority is taper and get off the med, taper and get off the med, which often leads to even more dysregulation. And I think, you know, that poison idea, that paradigm creates an issue of that stabilization is not as important as cessation. And I think stabilization is the number one important thing for people. And people will say, but I can never get stabilized. But oftentimes that's because they haven't held long enough. I held for three years, much against my will. I mean, I want people to hear loud and clear. I am not pro-medicine. I am, And I hate that I have to take the medicine that I do, but I have to function. I have no other choice. I would rather take the medicine I'm taking and function 
then taper more quickly and get sick again. I, I don't want to ever go back to those places again where I felt the way I did. So I would argue from a theoretical perspective, can somebody heal when they're on meds? Not, not sure. But can somebody be stable on meds? Definitely. Can somebody be regulated on meds? Definitely. Can somebody be functional on meds? Definitely. And I think at the end of the day, that's another thing. I think we need to redefine what healing means. Because to me, healing means it's a, st you know, there's different variables. You know, the first thing I would say, as I've been saying a lot already, is regulation and stabilization is the single most important variable for healing. Because that also settles the nervous system down and lets it to kind of operate more within the normal parameters and window of tolerance that it's designed to work within. And then I think the second thing is functionality. You know, we have to claw our way back into life after we've been so injured and dysregulated. And I think sometimes people get in this all or nothing. You know, if I can't have everything back, then what's the point? Well, I would argue that every time I have a victory, you know, let's say I used to only do five things you know, drive a little bit, maybe go to the store every once in a while. And all of a sudden I'm doing 10 things. It might not be the 50 things that I wish I could be doing. But if I've gone from five things that I could do to 10 things that I can do, I'm making healthy progress. And I think functionality is the real core of this. I think what we all want is to get back to our lives, get back to being able to do the things that we were pro able to do prior to this. Um, but I think, you know, when we get in this idea of healing, you know, do people fully heal? Yes, a lot of people, a lot of people do. Does everybody at this point, I would argue, maybe not. But that doesn't mean they don't get to a place of regulation, a place of stabilization, a place of functionality. That's where I'm at. I mean, I would say that, you know, I've said this in other interviews. I would say at this point, I'm 90 percent healed and 100 percent happy. You know, I still have lingering symptoms. I still can get fatigued really easily. I still can get dizzy. I can still have some adrenaline surges at times. But there are, there are things I've learned to live with and live within the parameters of what my nervous system can handle. But I'm moving to Kansas in a couple of days. I just moved out of my place. I have trips planned. I have, you know, I just went on a vacation. Um, you know, I've created a research institute. I've been able to do a lot of the things I dreamt about when I was injured. And that's the message I want people to hear loud and clear is that I'm not special. And if I can do this, then other people that are taking medication can too. Meaning that there, there is a path to stabilization that doesn't always require cessation. You know, again, and people will say, you know, I've worked with hundreds of clients over the last few years and people will say, well, I held. And I'm like, well, how long did you hold? And they'll say two weeks. And I'm like, ooh, that's probably not long enough. And I think that's, again, where the fear comes in, which is we've been convinced that the longer you take a medicine, there's a dramatically high risk of developing tolerance to that medicine and the medicine no longer, you know, having therapeutic effect. I would argue that's much more rare than we actually see in our practice. I would say the majority of the symptoms that people present with are maybe a part of the actual drug they're taking, but are an accumulation of all the mistakes we've made because we weren't given good information or nobody was really overseeing it. Or doctors also just have a tendency to haphazardly start, stop, raise, lower, um, add, subtract medicines and dosages. And so it's that accumulation. It's why I'd been on clonopin once before, and while it had caused some effect and some negative effects, it didn't cause anywhere near the effects it did the second time I tried to come off it. And, you know, I think again, that that was the accumulation of the mistakes probably the first time I tried to get off it and then combined with the second time. And I think for many people, you know, it's the accumulation of all the dose changes. It's the accumulation of all the subtractions and additions that lead us to this place where we are so dysregulated. You know, and again, I think we need to get to look at healing more on a continuum and functioning more on a continuum 
and stabilization and regulation more on a continuum. That people, even severely injured people, can get regulated again where they have some semblance of functionality, where they're increasingly able to do more. I have one client that I worked with, I've worked with now for three years, and two of the three years she was as destabilized as almost anybody I've spoken to. But because she did, I would argue, one of the hardest things on earth, which is to hold a medicine when you're suffering severely. She's so much more stable now. She's able to function again. She's able to do things like art and things like that that she was so disconnected from. And I just see this story repeated over and over in my coaching practice that when people kind of step away and let the nervous system calm down, because the, the nervous system likes predictability, it likes consistency. And every time we taper, every time we change a dose or add a med or subtract a med, we've changed the input that the nervous system is trying to manage. And I've always looked at, you know, I've always thought, is a multiple choice test easy, easier with two choices or 50 choices? Well, it's much easier with two choices. So I want to give my nervous system as little change and choices that it has to make so it can just get stable. Because again, I think stabilization is the key. Regulation is the key. And also, even sites like Inner Compass and things like that speak about how starting a taper from a more stable place generally can increase the odds of the taper being more successful. You know, I think at the end of the day, all I want is people to be okay. I want people to have their lives back. But I think I, you know, I see the withdrawal community convincing people that they're doomed if they don't get fully off the medicine and then people tapering rapidly and getting progressively sicker. I just want people to not suffer. They're suffering so much. And Let I'm me just jump in. To yeah, ways, I can just try to figure out ways real quick to, to reduce the suffering. And I guess that's, you know, I've been, I've been doing this long enough that I've got a decent cohort of people that have kind of gone through. And, and I could tell you, I have a lot of people who are still fairly sick off medications. You know, I'm talking for like, you know, six months, a year, you know, sometimes a little bit longer and they're still recovering. And I guess my perspective on that is, you know, being off all the medications didn't really help them. Um, and it seems like it was more a factor of time. Um, and I think it's always a factor of time, you know, when it comes to re-regulating. Yeah. I mean, you've, uh, you know, something's happened. There's been an injury, whether it was from a rapid withdrawal or whether it gradually developed from, uh, I guess, tolerance withdrawal and all of those processes that happen. And, and then the injury is there and it's typically one that can just take months to years to recover, you know, on or off the medications. Now I'm going to ask you a question, Chris, which is a question I actually don't know an answer to, um, but it's something that comes up a lot and I just want to get your thinking on it. A lot of the times these people who are saying, I want to stop this medication because I don't think I can heal. They're having paradoxical responses to it. You know, say someone's tapering like you know, clonopin or something like that. And uh, maybe they're taking it three times a day and they just go every time after I take my, you know, morning dose or my evening dose or something like that, I start getting jolts, I start feeling worse. And they're having this, um, you know, very predictable pattern of like getting worse. And, and they say it, they go, I, I feel like the drug is poisoning me. And I don't blame them because if I took the pill and my symptoms flared up slightly, um, then I would just be like, this thing needs to get out. I mean, what do you think about those situations? What does that mean when 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 that when that's happening? Because sometimes I'm like, maybe you know, maybe, you know that. I think I think it's it's the single like you just described to me the core of the most challenging dilemma that individuals find themselves in. Okay. I think that. I mean, I was actually talking to Nicole Lamberson about this tomorrow or yesterday. You know, I think that. If the medicine was truly paradoxical and truly, truly poisonous, every time we took it, we would get progressively worse and rapidly. Because if it was truly poison, you know, we wouldn't be able to take it for more than a week, I would imagine, and we'd be poisoned and dead. Mm -hmm. um, 
it is, I mean, and I'm not denying that there's a poison element to this for sure. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. like, I hope people realize I would never minimize any of this. But again, I would argue that person that finds themselves in that position has probably made 10 changes up to that point, you know, or adjustments or dose changes. So again, instinctively, my, my idea is to, to sit back and hold. But, you know, but again, it's hard too because you can do, have 10 people in that same conundrum and they can do 10 different things and have 10 different outcomes. There's some people that can actually rapid taper and get better. Yes, but I would argue that's a minority and those people are extremely lucky. I would say for the majority of people, it, it's almost a sign to taper even more slowly or to hold. I mean, again, the hardest thing on earth is when you're taking something that is having an, an effect like that, that you tie it, you know, in a sense to when, when I take it, it's making me sicker and then I still have to take it, you know, but I would argue like, like with my, like Seracol is a good example for me. I've been on Seracol for a while now and there've been different periods where I've had different reactions to it, but they tend to last a couple of weeks and then kind of work themselves out. Like I've had periods where I'll take the Seracol and instead of helping me go to sleep, it starts giving me adrenaline surges. But it was just tolerance of, okay, I have to ride this out, hoping my system can figure this out. And thank God it did. You know, maybe I was lucky in that respect. But, um, you know, I think the dilemma, again, is I don't see people rapid tapering and get better unless they're really lucky. I don't pe see people, because again, if getting off the drug was the issue, go, me going to the five-day detox, I should have been exactly like they told me I would have been. He'll be great in a month, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, if getting that poison out of my body was really going to heal me, it, it didn't. You know, I think what the, the, the trickiest thing is once we start introducing medicine, neuroadaptations happen. The brain makes adaptations and it's those adaptations that cause the problem because it then creates the chasm between what the drug's providing and what the brain needs. And you know, again, I, from my instinctive anecdotal experience of going through this for a long time, I truly believe holding for most people is the strategy. And it's because it gives the nervous system predictable input to try to calm down. Again, there's no one size fits all. And I'm not in any way minimizing that tolerance does happen. But I think especially with non-benzodiazepine drugs, it's much more rare, you know, it's, or it's not as prevalent as people would say. I wouldn't say it's rare, but not as prevalent. Mm -hmm. But even with benzodiazepines, I've had people hold that were very dysregulated and they got restabilized again. They got regulated again. And I think, you know, again, that's what we all want. We all want the people we're coaching or you're treating or, you know, overseeing to get regulated again, to be able to function again. And because I think for all of us, I would argue that's the goal. You know, the goal is to get back into our lives, to be able to do the things I used to be able to do. I mean, if I have to take these meds for a while longer, which I will have to probably, and while I am not happy, I hope people realize that I stomp my feet in rage when I have to take these. And I hate going to a pharmacy every three months and getting them. It, 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 it's an antithetical to who I am. But again, well, Chris, my nervous system's like... It's like a Jenga game, and I got to take those pieces out so slow so the Jenga doesn't collapse. Do you, do you mind me uh, asking if you could maybe tell us about your spirit experience tapering, like the metazapine, like what that's looked like over the last the metazapine and Seracol, what that's looked like over the last nine years? You know, you know sure. how you taper it, how you do it, kind of where you are at the moment, like you know how frequently you stop, kind of just to give people a sense of what this looks like over time. Sure. So for the first like five years after the detox, I held the Remeron and the Seracol. I was just too sick. I was too dysregulated. Do um, what doses you know, were they originally? That was at 100, and 100 of Seracol and 15 of the Remeron. And then okay. um, I tried to cut the Seracol about 18 months after the detox and it took my akathisia from a 10 to a 20. And so that was a huge mistake. My system just wasn't ready for it. Um, so I waited about five years and then I tapered from 15 uh, to seven and a half of the mirtazapine over 19 months um, using a liquid water titration. And I would say that that was relatively um, unremarkable. Um, you know, I would, 
you know, I would have some symptom increase in the mornings. I think everybody knows our mornings are so hard. A little symptom increase in the mornings, but by the afternoon and evening, generally I was decent. And I, I tapered, you know, I think the most important way, which is listening to my bottoms, uh, my body symptomatically. And when I got to seven and a half of the Remeron, then I decided I wanted to get off the Seroquel. Because uh, actually the Seroquel at that point at 100 milligrams was causing some dysphagia where the muscles in my throat were not working correctly. And that was a pretty distressing symptom. So then I decided, you know, I got to get off the Seroquel. But um, Seroquel is my beast. Um, it is my um, cross to bear. And it has taken me two and a half years to go from 100 milligrams of Seroquel to 76. Um, I'm 24 milligrams, 24% of the way there. So I feel like I've accomplished a fair amount. Um, but I have to go super slow. And in the last year and a half since I've been in a long distance relationship, I even slowed the taper down more because I just wanted to get even more increasingly functional. And I, I got that from holding um, the, the, you know, the, or the longer holds versus uh, more frequent cuts. Um, and that's benefited me. So like I said, I've gone from a 15 milligrams of the Remeron to seven and a half and from 100 to 76. And like I said at the beginning of the interview, I want to be kind of the model for people who are trapped on medicine. I'm trapped. That's it. I have no choice. Do I wrap a taper and go back to pacing 14 hours a day and maybe lose my life? No, I have no interest in that. I'm going to continue to stay within this parameter. And But, but I'm scared, too. I mean, I am scared these meds are potent and could, could cause issues in the future. But I have to work within the parameters I'm given and I want to function and I want to live my life. And I want to prove to people that are suffering and struggling that there is more than just one way to do this. It doesn't just have to be get off the meds. I mean, I'm still getting off the meds. And in a perfect world, I would stop them tomorrow, but I can't. And I want to model to people that you can function on support medicines or even on the primary medicine. Like my client in the, that I talked about referenced earlier that was so dysregulated, she's been taking benzos the whole time and held on the benzos even though she was convinced she was intolerant. And all of a sudden now they're having a much more powerful effect again where she's sleeping again and she's more regulated again on the exact same medicine. And that's really what I want people to get from this is that, you know, healing, stabilization, restoration, recovery, functionality, very, you know, varied rates of all of those is possible in this. Again, do people fully heal? I would say the majority do. Are there people that have lingering symptoms? Yes. Are there people that have impairment that gets in the way at times? Yes. But does that mean that most people, I would argue, if not almost all, except maybe a few outliers, which most people think they are, but they generally aren't, recover to a place where life is easily worth living. It's easily fun and engaging and fulfilling. And that's really what I want people to hear is that there's other ways to get through this that are effective too. And it's not just a one size fits all way of doing this. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you're going too fast? on your tapers, Chris, what happens? Your, your, my symptoms tell me loud and clear. My body goes slow down. I mean, for me, yeah. when I cut the Seroquel, I've kind of got a pattern now. Thank God patterns help too. First day, I actually feel better. It's as if that little less drug is just kind of leading to a little more clarity. And then the second day, I can get a little more symptomatic, a little more dizzy. Dizzy is one of my primary symptoms. Um, and then by day three and four, it usually settles. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, but again, I, I'm going very slow, very slow, because I just want to minimize any suffering. I've suffered plenty mm -hmm. and I don't want, you know, I'm really trying to stay as functional as I possibly can, because I also believe that every day that I get through, even on these drugs, is one day closer to me getting even more stable. You know, and every time I make a small cut, even if it's a small cut, that's a little less drug for my brain to, to handle or to navigate or, or, or work with. And like I said, in a perfect world, I would love to wake up tomorrow and never have to take another Seroquel and Remeron. I hate them. I, I, Let I me ask you this as well. I absolutely hate the process. Do you, are you, 
Um, are you holding on the 7.5 of metazapine, like no cuts while you're doing the Seroquel or do yeah, you do yeah, both? Hold, yeah, I've just been doing, no, I've just been doing one of the two right now, but I think if once I get to 75 of the Seroquel, I'm thinking about maybe trying to get to 3.75 of the metazapine and then leaving that to cover sleep when I try to get off the rest of the Seroquel. What, what are your thoughts about... That's um, kind of my... Yeah. I was going to say, what are your thoughts about, uh, I guess, concurrent uh, microtapers, you know, two drugs at the same time, microtapering, like kind well, of bringing I think, them down? I think for some people... Yeah. I think for some people, it's a brilliant way of doing it because, you know, the reality is, is my brain doesn't go, well, that's the Remeron and that's the Seroquel. It's just... Yeah. a cocktail of neurotransmission stew that I put in my body every night. And, yeah. you know, so I think that that I think for some people can be a very, very valid, reasonable way of tapering. Because I think, you know, it's, there's something symbolic, even when I make a 0.2 cut, 0.2, not two milligrams, but 0.2 cut out of a hundred milligram tablet, it's still progress. But I'm not willing to sacrifice progress for my own stability. I'm not willing to sacrifice this mythical getting towards the end of a taper at the sacrifice again of my functionality. And I would argue do you again, sometimes. I was going to say, do you sometimes no, just get hit out of nowhere with a wave these days? Like where it's like, you know, maybe for no reason at all, or just, or, or from, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll when be, you're ex overexerted. Yeah. I think like, like last weekend, I, I, I spent 16 hours moving, you know, and it was hot and I probably lost 10 pounds of water weight. And I was, you know, it overwhelmed my body. And also the stress of moving and the stress of giving up my home. And so this last week I had some pretty good insomnia a couple nights, which scares me because I'm taking these medicines predominantly for sleep. But once I kind of got past the psychosocial fear that, oh my God, I've changed my life and all these things are happening, I slept great the last two nights. So the medicine hadn't changed. It was just life stress had kicked up and for a couple of days was, you know, kind of overriding the medicine. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I. I mean, I, I, the day I get off these medicines will be a very celebratory day, I hope, because I'm going to do it in a way I hope that doesn't create issues after the taper. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's a word that we all hate, but we have to use sometimes, which is acceptance. I have to accept that this is what it is. Am I happy about it? No. Would I do everything in my power to change it? Yes. But I have to accept that I have to at least now keep that Jenga game intact, keep that house of cards intact um, as I slowly taper off these medicines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I think that's all the questions I have, Chris. Any, any final thoughts you want to add? Well, I would just say again, you know, that, that I do believe there's different ways that we can all succeed in this. Yes, for some people, tapering is a great idea. For some people, rapid tapering as is can be a good idea, but I would argue that's a very small minority of very lucky people. But for a lot of us that are kind of trapped in this situation where we're symptomatic but also taking medicine, I just want to show people that it's possible to be taking these meds and still get more stable again. I mean, am I fully healed? I don't think I've ever said anywhere in an interview or anywhere that I'm fully healed. I am healing and incredibly functional, incredibly happy, incredibly satisfied with where my life is. And that's what I want people to hear really loud and clear is that you can take these things that are awful and not something we would ever choose that we, with the knowledge we have to ingest, but still function and still have a life that's well worth living. Good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure.